Satyan Sangani. So Satyan is a good friend um, and is CEO in Al of Alation, and he's also a co-founder of Alation. In founding Alation, I love this sentence, Satyan, he aspired to help people dispassionately observe the world around them, empowering them to passionately work to improve it. Um, I love that description. Before Alation, Satyan spent nearly a decade at Oracle, where he ran the financial services warehousing and performance management business. Prior to Oracle, Satyan was an associate with a private investment firm, Texas Pacific Group, and an analyst with Morgan Stanley. He holds a master's in economics from the University of Oxford and a bachelor's from Columbia University. And Satyan is going to be talking about um, manipulating decision making and controlling behavior by violating privacy. So thank you so much, Satyan, for being here. Look forward to your talk. Okay, um, thank you, Sujata, for that introduction. And just wanna make sure that I can be heard as I pull up my slides. Yes, okay. Give me just one second. Oops. Let's try this. Okay, um, are you able to see some slides up in front of you? Yep, okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, so, um, as Sujatha mentioned, I'm the CEO of a company, uh, Alation, and I think it probably bears describing what I and we do in order to understand uh, what uh, we collectively bring to this topic. So broadly, Alation is a category of software that gets sold to lots of, uh, or it's a so it's software that, and um, uh, cloud-based software that gets sold to lots of large companies. And uh, many of these companies include uh, companies like General Mills and uh, uh, you know, Pfizer and also companies like Salesforce. And so these are large companies that are literally mining and discovering and producing data at extraordinary scale. And many of the people inside of these companies are both responsible for producing data and producing analysis. And as a result, sometimes producing recommendations and algorithms the sort that um, uh, Talita mentioned, uh, in order to be able to influence some form of decision making, either within the company or outside of the company. And so this work is being done at scale. There are literally thousands of people inside of any one given Global 2000, let alone you know the product of them can be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who are in these data professional roles. And so our, our general software helps these people use and understand the data better. Um, so, so with that context, um, you know, we think a lot about sort of responsible use of data, and a lot of our customers are trying to demystify that which that data which people are using because there are lots of technical complexities in getting people to understand and use data appropriately, um, but there are also uh, social complexities in getting people to use data appropriately. Um, one of which is that you know, data in many cases represents power. Right. If you if you think about uh, Talita's framing with regards to um, uh, with regards to hate speech, that expression of information, that expression of an idea, that expression of thought is power. So too is the knowledge of of the information of what people are doing and how they are um, behaving and what they may or may not be thinking. And so having that information requires some level of responsible use. It also, though, requires when people are using information for people to divorce themselves from bias, right? Science ultimately is, in theory, um, sometimes not in practice, but in theory, you know, uh, trying to evolve to be or to realize or to recognize what is ultimately true. Uh, and sometimes truth may not tell you things that you want to hear. And so in within these organizations, a lot of power and power centers develop and bureaucracies develop and often uh, the unwillingness to change means that people are not willing to use data. And so have this podcast, it's all focused on how people think about the social change around using data and leveraging data more broadly. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about, um, with all of that back context, because I think it's just helpful to understand how and why uh, I come to the conversation. Uh, the basic idea is about data privacy and how data privacy might affect um, an individual or a group of individuals. So segueing from um, Talita's presentation, which really focused quite a bit on the expression of knowledge, the expression of a point of view, free speech, 
Um, here, I think you know the the phase shift is really towards the consumption of information, and how does one have the right to consume information about individuals, about the world, about how people behave, how people think, and then what can people do and what can organizations do as they are consuming that information? And so that's where I think data privacy can play a um, as a construct, obviously, can play an instrumental role. And I think one of the um, really interesting social thinkers in this domain is Yuval Hariri. He's obviously written um, uh, quite a bit, uh, but one of the things that he talks about is this really interesting concept, which is called hacking humans. And the premise behind it is that, uh, as you can see from the quote, to hack a human being is to get to know a human better than, in fact, they know themselves. And and he uses some fairly interesting examples. Um, people who might be surfing the internet, uh, looking at content on the internet over time, and it might be that the internet knows that the person has a sexual orientation. Um, you know, for example, they might be gay, but they don't necessarily know and have not discovered that before they have, you know, exhibited behaviors, which an online algorithm might predict um, them to be that that them to be, you know, gay or or of a, another sexual orientation. And so, this is a you know, really interesting example of the 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 computers knowing you in some ways better than you might even know yourself. And so then the question becomes, well, what can you do with that information? And what you what might you be able to do with that information in guiding people or manipulating people appropriately? And I think this is a important area to discuss because in many ways, the algorithms are becoming so influential that it, it, it there is a real question as to whether or not agency is real or whether you're being led down a path towards doing something that might not be beneficial to you or maybe being led down a path that might be beneficial to you overall. Um, and so we see this in our everyday lives, right? I mean, it, it, this is not foreign territory for most of us. Uh, for those of us that watch Netflix, for those of us that shop on Amazon, which probably describes uh, more or less everybody uh, that that is tuned in today, uh, you know, those things tell us what to buy. I mean, we like the recommendations that come from Amazon or from Netflix because it offers us um, interesting things that people like us or people that have our interests might be also interested in. Uh, if you bought product X, then you might be interested in product Y. If you watched this particular episode or this particular show, you might be interested in these other shows. So these are generally speaking good things. And these are things that we benefit from because obviously it makes our lives easier in a world where there is an extraordinary amount of choice. Um, but there's, of course, a lot of other ways in which data privacy violations can harm people. And um, the most obvious of these is emotional distress. Um, I would imagine that if we did a show of hands, that um, almost everybody or a very big percentage of the people um, in the audience would have somehow been received a message that they may have had a password violation or that their uh, you know identity or privacy may have been hacked in some particular way. And certainly there is a very obvious uh, deleterious effect to people's anxiety and their you know emotional health because you don't necessarily know what's happened with that information. Um, there's obviously the result of that um, hacking, which could be that there is actual harm that you actually, lose money from your bank or that you are, you know, uh, incited to do something that you otherwise might not want to do. Uh, and then, of course, there's the time, right? Uh, how many of you have gone through a circumstance where you've had to clean up your credit report or disable an account that you didn't know need to exist or spend time changing passwords because you are worried about the fact that you're going to be um, somehow um violated? And so these are some obvious effects in terms of how you might be harmed. And the methods that happen, and these are online methods, but there are many, right? Um, certainly social media is a mechanism through which you can be harmed, right? You can be manipulated through a public website uh, to do something to be, as Talita to put it, incited uh, and manipulated into doing something that you might not have otherwise done. And that can be done either through an individual who is you know, specifically trying to get you to do something, um, or it can be done through an algorithm that may be uh, even more insidious. Um, there is also this entire secret world of ad retargeting. You might be surfacing on a, you know, you might be surfing on a website, and in the process of surfing on a website, 
you might be looking and have moused over information about an electric vehicle. And then all of a sudden, over time, you're served with 50 ads of different electric vehicles, which of course isn't a coincidence, but your surfing may not even have been something that you were doing totally consciously. And so now all of a sudden you're getting influenced to do something that's completely different because the algorithm has taken the information of your time on literally an innocuous ad and turned it into something that can be marketed and resold to people that might want you to buy their products. Um, and then of course, there's a, you know, a third example of an impact uh, where uh, you know, we, we hear a lot about people who are discriminated against for, for um, you know, credit reasons. Uh, and often it is because information about them uh, makes its way into a credit report or they are misclassified or even perhaps properly classified into groups that may not be able to get preferential treatment for uh, credit or other financial rewards. So there's lots of real harm that happens and we don't necessarily in all cases feel it or see it. Uh, but it can be can be quite challenging. And so, um, you know, I think you know, to get to get a little bit more formal about it, um, a privacy harm often can be required or designed to be something that is recognizable, specific, material, fundamental, or special. But if you think about those things, there is sometimes things are recognizable but non-specific. sometimes sometimes things are, uh, you know, fundamental, but non-impactful. And so these things are really quite intertwined and there's a lot of collinearity, as it were, in understanding the impacts of these things. And they're, they're not always um, uh, in harmony with each other. And so it can be quite gauzy and quite um, difficult to understand what is a privacy harm, how does that occur, and when has it actually happened? Um, and the other challenge, of course, is that there is uh, sort of subjective harms and objective harms, subjective harms um, being hard, even that much more hard to assess because when a particular privacy violation makes someone feel anxious or worried, you know, certainly there is harm there, mental and emotional harm, but not necessarily recognizable and not necessarily equal across a cohort that might be exposed to the same violation. And then, of course, there is objective harm, which is a little bit more measurable. But again, even though measurable, um, hard to quantify at, at scale. Um, and all of that sounds like super dystopian. Uh, all of that sounds really horrible and really bad. And it, you know, you just wonder why we share information at all. And, you know, if you were, if you were thinking about this, you would want to just package your information and hold up and not be a part of society. Um, and obviously, uh, that's taking it to a, to a, uh, you know, extreme, but there are benefits, right. To sharing your data. And those are real. And the most obvious one that I think all of us have benefited from is medicine more generally, um, clinical trials specifically. And then if you think about the COVID-19 vaccine, the ability for people to share their experiences with COVID, with treatment of COVID in order to be able to get to outcomes that allow us to all be vaccinated. And vaccinated over time. And if one thinks about things like personalized medicine, being able to really take our data and get from broad cohorts in running critical trials to very, very, very specific treatments and therapies in order to allow us to be getting the best care that we can possibly get, those are all things that we want. Those are all things that we need. Those are all things that will unequivocally improve our lives and make our lives better. And yet those things only occur by our participating or volunteering our data. Um, and then of course I mentioned the softer things like you know, Netflix or Spotify or Amazon, all of which are recommending things to us on a constant basis um, and you know, at doing so at scale. And so you know, interestingly, this tension about how we're affected and uh, how we might be helped is also a tension that exists inside of companies that we see every single day because they are the ones building the algorithms, building the analyses, understanding the data in order to be able to figure out how they might be able to help you. And when their help turns into harm is a really, really, really challenging continuum, right? 
Um, one of the best examples, uh, you know, that I've that I've heard in this continuum is, and some of you have may have may have heard about this experience. Uh, there was a teenage girl who was pregnant and in and had you know been looking for uh, I- information on pregnancy tests, and uh, in the mail, her father had received uh, basically a coupon for um, pregnancy tests, and and so this this happened with Target. And so now all of a sudden her privacy was ousted, even though in theory Target was trying to do a good thing uh, for that for that family and individual. And so it just gets really tricky. Um, and and you don't always know as a practitioner uh, when you are violating somebody's privacy or when you're helping them. And and so that intention and the sophistication of these algorithms can be can be really quite tricky. So um, hopefully that. You know, my intention with this talk and is really to just sort of set up um, the problem statement. I think uh, Melissa and Chris are going to follow up with some of the reg, regs that, you know, in particular in the United States exist. But if you've heard of GDPR, this is obviously a global issue and something that I think, frankly, United States has been behind on more than it's been ahead of the game on. But, um, you know, I think when you think about how to consider data, consider the use of data. There is so much power in it, um, both for good and for bad. And, you know, like anything, um, you know, our ability to sort of cope with that is to to really understand what are the alternatives and how um, much nuance there is in, in the world of data and the world of privacy. Um, and so Hariri comes back and basically says, look, there's a couple of frameworks. I think, um, you know, one of which is that you know, data should be used to help me and not manipulate me. I think, you know, that again is is an interesting statement. It's hard to know when help and manipulation are are at odds with each other because maybe by manipulating you, I'm actually helping you. Um, you know, if I serve you ads to go to college, um, then am I manipulating you or am I telling you something that's good for you to do? Um, you know, also interesting, the idea of increasing surveillance on the corporation as you're increasing surveillance on the individual. Theoretically amazing, but then of course you look inside of these corporations and we sell to them all day long. And what I will tell you is even within the corporations, many of the people who work inside of them don't understand the complexity of what is happening with these algorithms or inside of these companies. And the expertise is so specific that people within the company, let alone people outside of the company, have a very limited ability to interact and understand what's happening inside of those institutions. And then the idea of being able to centralize the data is also an interesting framework. But again, you know, conceptually really challenging because what does it mean to not allow the data to be in one place? You know, within these companies, is one place a physical location? Is it a single physical database? Is it connected databases? Um, if it's consolidated, how does one necessarily know that you can't actually access it all? So there's a real technical and um, uh, uh, sociological complexity to administering these concepts, even if they're helpful ways to analyze the information. So uh, I have a couple of other slides on regulations, but I think Melissa is going to get into a little bit of that. So I figure, um, you know, all I can do here is set up a problem and um, hopefully give you, you know, some level of uh, insight into what the challenges are that practitioners and even academics have to deal with in thinking through uh, how to balance the regulation with the benefit. So hopefully helpful and Sujata, back to you. Yes, thank you, Sathya. No, that was very interesting. So I will um, open it up for questions. So same thing, if you wanna put questions uh, in the chat or uh, raise your hand, Melissa, I see your hand. Trying to figure out how to unmute myself. <laughs> um, thank you, Sathya. And that was uh, really helpful um, and a really great, um, kind of intro to my presentation as well. But before putting the cart before the horse, I'm curious for your thoughts on kind of who we think should be regulating in this space, right? Because as we're gonna talk about, and as you alluded to a little bit, the US has been very far behind at the government level of trying to regulate in these space to make sure that data is used responsibly. And I think Talita spoke about, you know, corporate governance is their social responsibility there on the, the ha- behalf of a, of a corporation that's handling this much information and, and has the ability and the power, as you say, to to really influence um, individuals' decisions. And so I'm curious, um, 
what you think is the best regulatory approach. Um, you know, when you think about, you know, the government often being so far behind um, and the, the pace at which technology changes um, and kind of where, where you think um, it makes most sense for that, for those regulations to stem from. Yeah, I, I, I'd be, uh, I, I almost, uh, I don't know is the, the, the honest answer. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you look at the United States and you you can sort of see it in a, a total extreme where I think this sort of, um, you know, Elon Musk free speech absol absolutism with sort of corporations having free reign, like you can say, okay, that's obviously horrible and obviously results in real harm. And so I think clearly that's not working. And on the other hand, you look at some of the more activist, um, you know, jurisdictions and you, I think, almost have this purist approach towards what might be happening and what can be regulated. And often what happens is that the regulations become so impractical, uh, impractical as to be largely irrelevant or impossible to follow. And so it is really hard. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't envy, I don't envy the regulatory role. I do think transparency is super important. I think that the biggest thing that matters in all of this is, um, on some level, in the same way that we have academic journals and trust, I think transparency is a really, 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 really important part of of these algorithms and what companies can do, and you know, being able to discover the case law. Because I do think it has to be handled essentially ground up as opposed to top down with some theoretical framework. Uh, the theories have you know help, and they can guide assessment and uh, judgment, but I think it's going to be really difficult. And I think, you know, blockchain, frankly, I think has a lot to be able to contribute here, although probably far, far longer term because the technical implementations can be pretty challenging. So sorry, it's not a very satisfying answer, but, but yeah. So I, I have a question for you about, um, so the, the, the last point you made about not allowing the data to be concentrated in one place. Um, and, you know, and particularly now after the election cycle, people have been saying that we should be able to vote by phone, including your friend, Wynn, <laughs> we should have a, we should have an ability to, uh, to, you know, to, to, to like, like pick up a phone and just, that's it, like put, uh, cast our vote. I worry about the protection of that data um, because it will have to be somehow, right, be concentrated in one place. I mean, is the, is that the, what do you think about uh, data protection when it comes to, that direction we're moving um, for voting in electronic forms, particularly. Yeah, I think it's, it's a very antiquated system in Connecticut, you know, where you're like, still every everything is to be checked by the paper ballot. And it almost seems like that's going to be historic, you know, any minute, but I worry about the data protection. Yeah, it's, it's really quite challenging. Um, because what you really care about is, uh, you know, th so there's an entire world of um, sort of technological study around uh you know databases and their immutability um and the uh, and so there's lots of different technologies that exist that are in theory expected to vault data or or make sure that one cannot change it without an audit trail and even blockchain as i mentioned gets into this detail quite significantly like you, you blockchain in theory creates this immutable ledger that allows you to trace every single transaction within that chain and to undermine the history. And so that would be a form of a database that in theory is actually capturing things in one place that couldn't be helpful because it's actually creating this his history, this lineage of what, what's actually happened. Um, and yet there's also been lots of papers and you know actual um, experiences where people have hacked blockchains. And so, you know, um, I, I don't, I don't know that I don't know that the idea of putting things in one place in and of itself is either harmful or useful, like, or, or, or very useful. Um, I do think that, you know, as I mentioned with, um, with Melissa's question, it does really depend on like, what's the best state of the art in terms of the technical implementation and um, how accessible is it and how air gapped is it? And there's a lot of um, tech to be brought to bear in order to be able to make things secure. And one more question about data manipulation. You know, so you said it's you're basically manipulating interests that that people already have. So sort of preconceived interests. 
is it that they're manipulating interests that are there or creating um, new interests through the through the images that are being shown over time and in fact creating a sense for creating an interest that actually didn't exist before which is a little more problematic i think uh, both are problematic but different than just manipulating what someone's sort of already preconceived notions are yeah it could absolutely be both right i mean the first time you see an ad it's it's sort of inception as it were if you've seen the movie and then and then you know on some level um, and this is kind of fun where like life imitates art, imitates life, but, but, you know, there's this idea of like putting an idea into your head and then there's exploiting that to be able to guide behavior. Um, and that's a continuum. Um, yeah. And again, could be great, could be horrible in, in its realization. <laughs>